Looking for an easy way to support smart recovery? Sign up for the Smart Insiders Plus program. For a small recurring contribution, you'll receive a special Insiders Plus welcome package. Be among the first to receive important news and engagement opportunities and see firsthand how your support is driving change in communities across the country. Learn more and sign up at smartrecovery.org forward slash insiders. Join us as we help more people everywhere lead life beyond addiction. Welcome to the Smart Recovery Podcast, where we offer thoughtful conversation about a variety of recovery topics. You'll hear self-empowering and science-based approaches to making changes toward a healthier and more satisfying lifestyle and building a life beyond addiction. Our mission is for every podcast to provide you with the information and resources you need to guide your own successful recovery journey. If you or someone you know needs addiction-related help, we encourage you to visit smartrecovery.org, where you will find practical tools, connections to support group meetings, and links for additional resources. Remember that the purpose of this podcast is to educate and inform. It is not a substitute for medical care from a doctor or other qualified addiction professionals. Before making any changes in your treatment plan, please discuss your thoughts with your medical provider. Now sit back and enjoy today's Smart Recovery Podcast. Welcome to the Smart Recovery Podcast. I'm your host, Luke Frazier. Today on the podcast, we're very excited to talk with Dr. Joseph Gerstein, MD, a fellow of the American College of Physicians and founding president of Smart Recovery. He is also a retired clinical assistant professor of medicine from the Harvard Medical School and a frequent lecturer and presenter at Harvard Addiction Symposiums. Dr. Gerstein is responsible for introducing SMART into Great Britain and many countries, including Australia, Vietnam, and South Africa, and he has facilitated over 3,000 SMART meetings. Joe Gerstein, welcome to the SMART Recovery Podcast. Thanks. Great to be here. All right. Now, obviously, there are many topics we could talk about based on your experience and expertise, but we're going to kind of focus on motivation and how it relates to recovery. But before we get into all that, tell our audience a little bit about your personal background, as well as any professional highlights not mentioned in uh, my introduction. Sure. Well, I am an uh, internist, a specialist in internal medicine and a pain management specialist. So uh, most of what I've learned about addictions, I've learned by facilitating smart recovery meetings. And therefore I have to blame the participants for teaching me <laughs> uh, most of what I know about it. Uh, but it's been uh, a thrilling accumulation of information Yeah, over well, 31 years. Yeah, that's, that's, that is a long time. And my and special interest has been in correctional uh, arena prisons and jails. I've done almost 800 meetings there in those places. And we have an extensive suite of countries and, and prison and correctional systems that are using smart recovery tools and smart recovery materials around the world. Yeah, that's uh, had several important studies done uh, on that that were very successful and mm -hmm. many other pilots. Well, that, I mean, that's an important um, segment of people, of audience that really needs to be reached because many times, I'm sure you'll, uh, you, you know this yourself, that in correctional facilities, there's uh, a lot of folks struggling with addiction. Yes, uh, probably the estimate is that about 70% of people who are in prisons and jails have either addicted to substances or uh, were using them at the time when they uh, committed their crimes. Mm -hmm. So clearly it is a, a huge, huge social problem. Right. Well, let's dive into the idea of motivation. Um, I mean, is there a way to dev define motivation as, as you're using it when you talk about you know, recovery and motivation? Well, it, it really breaks down into two components. One is the desire to cease the negative behavior that we call addiction. And uh, the second is the commitment to do it. And uh, sometimes they are 
co-equal and other times the motivation is high and the commitment is low. Sometimes because people uh, discouraged, they've tried to stop, they can't, and they, they, they're very doubtful that they can do it. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, part of it is also the expectation of whether it's possible for them. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a simple and yet sometimes a complex phenomenon. Yeah, uh, that can be uh, the case with many, uh, I think, psychological, psychosocial, um, even recovery issues can be, at least on the surface, appear pretty straightforward and simple. But when it comes to the real world, it can kind of be a, a little bit different. Um, you think that's true? Yes. I mean, I uh, ask people, generally new people coming, new participants coming to a smart recovery meeting to rate their motivation to permanently, <clears throat> uh, permanently uh, leave their addictive behavior or substance and uh, rated zero to 10. And uh, somewhat shockingly, it's runs, the average runs around seven and a half or eight. Mm. So many people come in and uh, whether because they fear they think they can't do it or they fear they won't be able to do it or they simply feel that it's so important to them that they're ambivalent about it. So this was a big shock to me when I first got involved. I knew very little about addictions. I graduated medical school in 1961. Mm -hmm. I just had my uh, 60th reunion. No, oh, wow. And, uh, and uh, uh, addictions were very low on the uh, on the totem pole of interest. I think I had about two hours of lecture on addictions. Oh, and, half and probably I thought was wrong. Yeah, what I was taught was wrong. Yeah. And probably there wasn't a lot of um, people that would do, um, uh, you know, internships or the kinds of placements in addiction medicine. Yeah, I mean, I don't even know if there was such a thing as a fellowship in, in addiction medicine. And uh, addiction medicine wasn't a recognized specialty till about eight or nine years ago. Okay. Uh, uh, now, so even 50, you're saying about 50 years ago. I mean, uh, it took 50 years. Oh, there was years. nothing, nothing. Yeah. And uh, maybe in the whole city of Boston, which is a mecca of uh, medicine, uh, international mecca, maybe there were two people who... Mm two psychiatrists maybe who would consider themselves specialized in the addiction arena. Yeah. Now that's, that's interesting because the need for addiction medicine is so great and growing. And we hear about the overdose deaths and we hear about the families and other, uh, other, other groups that are just really being destroyed by some really uh, some behaviors or addictions yet there back then, if you will, there was probably the same kind of problems. They just weren't recognized. Yeah, well, it, it didn't have the extent that it does now, obviously. I mean, cocaine uh, wasn't even thought to be addictive. And every doctor's office had a little bottle of 7% cocaine. It's a wonderful um, uh, local anesthesia. I had a, uh, an, an abscessed ear, a uh, otitis media lanced by, a, by an ENT doctor. And he just put a drop of cocaine on my uh, uh, on my uh, membrane in, in my ear, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. that completely relieved the pain. He went ahead and lanced it. Yes, so. I didn't feel anything. So now you you wouldn't dream of having a bottle. That's of cocaine right. That's right. Right. Yeah. right. That would be uh, that would be a, a chance of malpractice, maybe for right. Uh, right. for the pre people. Right. Um, well, that is that is interesting because it it just speaks to advancement in education advancement in awareness. And you yourself have added to that awareness by, as I mentioned, being a lecturer, being a presenter, um, talking about it with uh, folks in medical school, uh, students. Right, yes. Yeah. And uh, for the first time, I'm, I'm, I'm a Brown graduate, but undergraduate, but now Brown has a medical school. And uh, its class that just graduated was the first class where in which the graduates were eligible on graduation to have the waiver for, for the uh, uh, prescription of buprenorphine and methadone. Mm. So that was integrated into their medical classwork. Is that, and, is that around the country have, at all? We have a uh, professor, Bruce Lee, at the University of Kansas. He's a professor of uh, 
psychology and family medicine, he is training the entire freshman class of the University of Kansas Medical School as smart recovery facilitators. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. And and the audience for this podcast knows how much smart recovery can do uh, as a recovery pathway and as a part of the recovery field, and which is which is just excellent. The more it spreads, the more education, um, et cetera. But let's go back to actually the the topic of motivation. Now you mentioned there is motivation and then there is commitment. How does motivation translate into commitment? How does it, what's the relationship there? Well, uh, obviously our objective as facilitators and as a program is to move people from the seven and a half or eight to the 10. Now, uh, that doesn't mean they're going to succeed. It's a very difficult mountain to climb and, and uh, may take two, five, 10, um, I run into one man who had 87 detox admissions, mm. 87. Wow. Yep. Then he found smart recovery and he's now, he's now running a meeting every week in Champaign, Illinois. Fantastic. So, I mean, uh, 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 some people get it. the average, uh, for instance, the, the average, uh, the median, the median number of admissions to a residential rehab that results in um, in recovery is two, mm. but we all know there's people who've had five, 10, 15, uh, admissions, uh, and still aren't there. Right. So, uh, so it's a very complex phenomenon, but to me, the, the, uh, the difference is people reach, uh, and then of course there are the other people who stop, but they hate it. Mm. They, they stop, they say, I can't do it anymore. It's life uh, degrading and whatever, and it's affecting everything. And I'm just not going to do it, but they're still, they're still craving. I wish I could do it. If I mm. only could do it, uh, I should be able to do it and so forth. So it's a very uncomfortable, it's a recovery, but it's an uncomfortable and incomplete recovery. But what we're hoping for is that people get to a point when they no longer feel like they need to have access to their addictive substance or behavior mm -hmm. and, and they, they don't need it anymore. They right. don't want to do it anymore. Right. It's, it's something that they did in the past and it's just not part of their life anymore and so forth. And that's, um, that's uh, I, I guess one would call that a cure. Mm. Um, uh, Jack Trimpey, who initiated this whole movement, uh, I drove him occasionally to introductory meetings. Someone would always ask, can you ever be cured of alcoholism? And he answered it this way, which I think was very, uh, very direct. You're cured when you don't drink anymore, no matter how bad it gets. Mm. So matter so, the circumstances in your life. Yeah, it's or, like, or, yeah. it's like uh, cutting the umbilical cord for people. Mm -hmm. And it's a very painful thing to do. Yeah. You're listening to the Smart Recovery Podcast. I'm your host, Luke Frazier. Today, we're talking with Dr. Joseph Gerstein. We're talking about motivation around other kinds of recovery concepts, recovery tools. And uh, this has been a great conversation so far. Um, Joe, you, you mentioned that people who they have stopped, but they still have these feelings or desires or compulsions is that something that smart recovery can help address? Uh, you know, the, the motivation might be there. The commitment was made. Now the substance use has been stopped. But how do you bring them to, as, as Smart says, a life beyond addiction? Well, when we started, uh, we being the, the founders, the founding group of uh, Smart Recovery, which was back in 1990, um, uh, it was only a two-point program. Uh, coping with urges and using cognitive behavioral techniques to deal with emotional distress. And um, pretty quickly, uh, certainly I realized that uh, we were missing an important component, which was a motivational enhancement component. And that came first and we developed some tools. Uh, but uh, then probably within a year or two, uh, we also noticed something else was missing. And that was 
lifestyle balance. Mm -hmm. uh, people who uh, have an addiction tend to focus on that, to obsess about it, and uh, spend, uh, especially if it's an illegal drug that's involved, 24-7. Uh, mm. And thinking about it, thinking about doing it, how to get the pay for it, how to cover it up, and so forth. It's a full-time job. Right. It's more than a full-time job. It's an all 24-7 job. And uh, uh, when they stop, when they decide to stop and they try to stop, there's a lot of emptiness in their lives. A lot of them have uh, destroyed their career, destroyed their family relationships, whatever. And it's pretty empty. And boredom is the devil's workshop. Mm. <laughs> That's that right. Idle, ha idle hands, as they say. Yeah. And, um, and so anyway, we uh, then developed this uh, this. Uh, 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 this lifestyle balance uh, program, which we talk about as being substituting enduring satisfactions for immediate gratification. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, summarizes uh, the difference between uh, a normal life and an addictive life when uh, immediate gratification becomes the most burning issue, overwhelming issue mm -hmm. in your life. And also, it's a measure of maturity. I mean, maturity, if you want to describe it, is really the ability to defer gratification. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, that's my definition. anyway. Well, sure, because you can see in children, there is uh, very little of that. When when you right. want a lollipop, you want it right now and you're going right, to cry right, right. and your hand in the cookie jar, Mom hand in the cookie working. jar, you're going <laughs> to stamp your feet. And, and right, uh, right. That, that's right. interesting, though, does does the idea that the more you balance your lifestyle, does that then feed into reinforcing the motivation and the commitment? I mean, all well, of a sudden, sure. I mean, I mean, look, we all hope that life will improve. Your life will improve after you stop drinking or drinking or gambling or whatever. And I would say that's by far the most frequent result. Mm -hmm. However, there are people who, uh, who have pretty much cut all their bonds to others who have uh, lost all their money, all their, all their uh, job potential, whatever. Uh, and uh, for them, uh, it's going to be, you know, a rough, a rough road to uh, run because they don't uh, have all those supports and, and, uh, and gratifications and whatever, and can be pretty empty. Mm -hmm. So uh, we 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 want to focus on that, and and uh, much of the time in our meetings is uh, once people pass that threshold where they have a significant period of success, uh, then concentrate on getting their so-called vital vitally engaging activities mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that that uh, hobby new hobbies new relationships uh, mm -hmm. exercise all those other. Sure things that uh that uh make life engaging yeah. beyond the yeah. uh, crave you know beyond substances right so is that where the the mutual support comes in that people joining together talking to one another maybe sharing experiences like you know i felt really bored after i stopped fill in the blank um but here's what i did and other people get to hear that from from peers yeah, I mean, well, there's two things that uh, that the two benefits of peers who are uh, are along the line in success and recovery, and that is the mentorship, the encouragement, the affirmation, but also reasonable suggestions about ways that they can uh, uh, improve their lifestyle and uh, 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 get new activities, new friends, and 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 whatever. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the uh, we don't give people advice in smart recovery. We find that that's not consistent with our motivational interviewing ethos, and usually not helpful. Mm. Uh, but we make give people options, suggestions. This worked for me. This is something you might want to think about, and so forth and so on. Yeah. And um, uh, sometimes they're apt, sometimes they're not, but. Uh, uh, generally speaking, uh, people appreciate uh, reasonable suggestions and yeah. options. Especially if they're not feeling pressured that this is the way right. we do it. This is the way it must right. be done. But again, that just sounds like something getting those suggestions, getting the mentorship feeds back into motivation, which then feeds commitment. 
So it's kind of a cycle. Is that is that a, um, a sure. accurate well, way to look at it? Look, uh, success leads to success. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's that's the nature of human uh, activity. Right, and so you'll do more of it. You know, when you get something right. from it, I, when I do things, you know, when I take a, a nice walk in the woods, it feels really good. I have a good time. I get some fresh air. I feel better after. I'm going to go do that again. Right, right. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, you know, we're a habit forming breed, humans, and uh, good habits uh, <laughs> obviously are <laughs> constructive and bad habits are yeah. destructive. And uh, and uh, we often don't differentiate. Yeah. And, but why, uh, why do you think, though, that uh, I've heard this and actually my own experience is getting into a positive habit takes a while and can be lost more easily, like exercise. You don't exercise for a couple of days. You can kind well, of start yeah. to ignore it. But bad habits can be lasting. Well, I mean, think about uh, the social development of humans. I mean, ex exercise is a very recent development. People <laughs> okay. used to work. That's yeah, how right, right. Up from dawn to from dawn till dusk and beyond. Yeah, yeah. you work. You threw bales of hay and you chopped down trees and things like that. Right. And for most right. of us now, work is uh, what we're doing right now. Okay, mm -hmm. and uh, that is not conducive to total bodily health. So no, no, we're sitting here. We're sitting here talking and using our minds and such. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> So of course that's the in some that's the idea to replace bad habits with good habits. Mm -hmm. you know? And sometimes well, it's easy. Sometimes people they say, well, uh, you know, I I was uh, I went to my uh, third sister's wedding and I was sober and I had a wonderful time, and I remember every minute of it, and I won't remember anything about my previous two sisters' mm -hmm, weddings. Mm -hmm. So that's self. Uh, self-reinforcing that kind of experience obviously yeah. so if you have better experiences and and uh, more better social interaction and so forth uh, obviously that's uh, that's great encouragement and reinforcement of uh, positive behavior yeah now as you mentioned the if if most of the participants come to a smart meeting with some degree of or even a great degree of motivation you said i think seven or so on the on the uh, scale of one to ten seven or eight what happens when someone walks in there? I mean, they've at least made the decision to come to a meeting, but their motivation right. is still quite low. Is there something that can be done um, in that case? Well, I mean, we can't drag people kicking and screaming into the meeting. There's a whole, a whole literature about coerced attendance. As you know, some people want to have a card signed or something or other. And uh, in general, it's more difficult to motivate those people. Once in a great while, we have somebody come in, they say their motivation is five out of 10. Mm. But they're usually someone with, with a mild problem. Sometimes it's even questionable. Is it really raise, the rise to the level of an addiction, so forth and so on. So pretty much, unless people get up over five, uh, they don't show up at a, mm. uh, at a okay. mutual aid group. Okay. Uh, and, and uh, it takes, you're right, it takes a lot of motivation to do that. Um, I uh, sometimes ask people, uh, for instance, I, I, I once in a while I take a poll, I said, how many people found it easy to come to their first mutual aid group meeting? As a rule, nobody puts their hand up. Mm. Occasionally so somebody says, well, I did. And I said, well, how, how did it happen? They said, well, I was in a rehab and a group of us went to the meeting. Well, that's, mm -hmm. you know, that's a special situation yeah, where sure, sure. You, you don't have much apprehension because you have, you're bringing your gang with you and you, you mm -hmm. feel protected mm -hmm. or what, whatever. So walking through that door solo seems to be extremely difficult for mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes somebody put their hand up, yeah, no big deal. I just decided to come and so forth. And uh, uh, I said, well, how long did you think about maybe coming to a mutual aid group meeting before you did it? So, oh, about a year. Yeah, yeah, so, long time. You mm -hmm. know, it is not easy. It is mm -hmm. not easy. I mean, in a rare case, maybe it is, but yeah, it's it's intimidating in some way. It's humiliating to say I can't take care of this problem. Uh, maybe the same thing goes for going to a private practitioner or telling your doctor, I yeah. have a problem, I'm drinking too much, and right. so forth and so on. As a rule, I find when I question people, uh, they have a physician, the physician is not aware 
of their problem mm. or the degree of their problem mm -hmm. uh, often. That uh, may they, be a training issue itself, Joe. I mean, we've talked about how much more it's brought up in medical school, but not, not completely. Right, right. Mm. And, and uh, 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 you know, I don't know if they asked the question. I mean, they certainly should in this era when you're taking an initial history on a patient, you certainly ought to be asking mm -hmm. about their drug and alcohol history. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's, uh, uh, that's practically malpractice at this point, not to uh, bring up that issue. And, and uh, now they may lie to you. That's, that's yeah. obviously right. up to them what they do, but, but it, it is a, it should be an integral part of the history. Yeah. which is the most important part of the medical exam. Yeah. Because it affects uh, bodily systems. I mean, if someone comes in presenting well, with, uh, I mean, an obvious yeah. way of, let, let's say, really uh, compromised liver function, I mean, you could, I'm sure there would, that would lead to some discussion. Yeah. But... Well, I mean, it's a, a whole panoply of, of problems, social mm -hmm. and uh, medical That's arise right. from most mm -hmm. addictions, including sudden death, right. uh, which is all too common now. Right. Yeah. Well, um, we're kind of wrapping up here about this, uh, this great conversation about motivation, some of the things that smart recovery does, how people are uh, responding to smart recovery and, and making that commitment. And is there anything else right now you wanted to talk about with motivation or the idea that motivation um, is such an important part of recovery? Well, I give a lot of introductory talks and often someone says, but what's the most important thing, you know, if you, if you want to recover, or if you want to be successful in recovery? And I say, well, number one, motivation. Number two, motivation. Number three, motivation. Mm -hmm. uh, how do I know that? Well, about uh, the best data we have is with alcohol. So about 30% of people who recover completely, as completely as we could say, let's say five years of sobriety after a alcohol addiction period, um, uh, they don't go to mutual aid groups, they don't go to doctors, they don't go to social workers, they mm. figure it out for themselves mm -hmm. and they stop. It's not easy to find these people. They don't wear a t-shirt. So yeah, sure, exactly, drunk. exactly. How would you know, yeah. right? Well, the uh, last NIH study on this randomly contacted 18,000 people mm. in order to derive enough people who had sobriety after mm -hmm. an addiction to make a determination about this. So the, and the data is pretty clear from mm. other studies as well. Right. With alcohol, at least it's about 30% of people stop on their own. Okay. Might be their tenth time they tried it. But they yeah, right, it. right. And, and, and they, the motivation grew yeah. as they went along. Yeah. Yeah. So we know that that's, that's important. Now, sometimes people say, well, why are you telling us this? Because you have a group. I said, well, we tell you the truth here. We tell mm. you what the scientific facts are. Yeah. Um, and it's important for you to understand that people do this. That right. is within the competence of human beings, obviously, to develop an addiction. And it's also within their competence to stop it. Difficult, yeah, which, is, which is part of self-empowerment, is it not? Of course. Of yeah. course. That's part of our name, self-empowerment. Mm -hmm. That's, right. self That's right. But it's a, it's a self-empowerment with help, with mutual help. Which is uh, which is obviously useful, and it happens to be free. Now there, <laughs> also a nice thing, a powerful uh, combination. Yeah, uh, for free. Uh, the, yeah, the other thing is that um, um, people uh, people's motivation is uh, related. Well, I, I see two types of motivation. One type, the most common type, is. Uh, the buildup of negative consequences reaches a point where people say, you know, this is now not tolerable to me anymore. I have to do something about this. They've probably tried to cut down and all kinds of gimmicks, like only drinking on holidays mm -hmm. or wedding mm -hmm. and things like that. It hasn't worked out. And now they say, well, I, I don't want this to go any further. I've accumulated sufficient negative legal, medical, occupational okay. relationship okay. of uh, destructiveness that, that I, I have to do something about it. Sure. That's one type of motivation. 
There is another type. It's less usual, I would say. It's not rare, but it's it's a motivation to reach goals mm. that they have plans for, and they can see is, is it going to happen if they continue their addiction. Okay. If they spend a lot of time, uh, like you were talking about, time thinking about it, getting thinking it. Thinking about it, doing it, mm-hmm. and, yep. and also being inebriated or high or whatever. Okay. Or, or okay. Or chilled out with uh, marijuana. Yeah. Uh, uh, in the days when we had a telephone in, in our <laughs> office. Yeah, was my right. kitchen. A desk and, phone, for those who don't know what it meant. It was a phone right. that was actually on a desk. <laughs> A physical, with, a, yeah. with a cord attaching it with to the, the wall, right? Right, yeah. with a cord. Yeah. So we got a call. It's just to talk to people. So I remember one person called me. Said, "Where's the meetings and so forth?" And uh, I said, "What's the problem?" He said, "Well, it's marijuana." Anyway, the conversation went on. And then at one point, he said, "Well, he said, I'm 32 years old. I have a master's degree, and I realize that I'm not going anywhere. I just..." I'm just existing. I just am interested in getting work to make enough money to buy marijuana. And I just suddenly woke up and said, well, you know, where am I going? Mm. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is, yeah. Yeah. this is a new problem that we yeah. have now. It, 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 I guess some people did smoke marijuana back when I was in medical school, but it, it certainly wasn't a a uh, a, a, scour- a scourge, like yeah, a, right, now. right, a very wide, uh, widespread. But that sounds uh, like is is the term intrinsic motivation. Does that apply here? Versus, yeah, I guess that's a very good, a uh, uh, very good terminology um, to differentiate a uh, goal oriented okay motivation versus a a uh, avoidance. Uh, a positive, let's say a right. positive okay. orientation okay. versus an avoidance or a negative orientation. Yeah. And that would be a something bad. Yeah. yeah. Well, that would be a high degree of motivation. This person yes, called yes. you, said, Where's I, where can I, I find well, help? It's a it's a different uh, a different uh, qualitatively different uh, issue. I don't know if one's better than the other. As a rule, I would say in human psychology, a positive motivation mm-hmm. is better than a negative motivation. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, we've been, yeah, we've motiv- been talking. Motivation to achieve a goal, to improve your life, to lead a decent life, um, uh, is is uh, is I think not only commendable, but uh, but uh, it 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 is motivating. Right. Whereas a a attempt to escape negative consequences uh, uh, harbors a, a, a an antipathy somehow towards society and towards uh, the drug dealer and right. you know all the negative influences that you perceive have caused your problem. A common, a common problem for people is to say at a meeting when they come in, alcohol brought me here. Mm. Uh, al- alcohol is my problem. And I discuss this with them in this way. I say, well, you know, alcohol is just a liquid in a bottle, mm-hmm. a substance. E-T-O-H, we say in, uh, in um, chemical terminology, ethanol, mm-hmm. and it's just sitting there and it's got a cover on it. And your decisions are what brought you here. Your mm-hmm. decisions about what to do about alcohol. Mm-hmm. It's so important to see agency, your agency. Because if alcohol is the cause of your problems, it's going to be very difficult to yeah. solve it. It's available everywhere. And every oh, gosh. Street- Mm-hmm. In a bottle, in a glass, whatever, at a party, uh, in a mm-hmm. restaurant. Yeah. But um, but if you understand it's your decisions that are the crucial thing, then you that's something you have control of. Right, and now you'll you'll mo- be motivated to uh, to do something about it and be reinforced when you go to a smart meeting and make that commitment. Well, this is yeah, same a, thing. Yeah. People people say, well, I fell off the truck. Mm-hmm or I slipped Mm -hmm. and I tried to get them to recalibrate to this. It was not an accident. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Slipping on the ice is Is an an accident. accident. Right, right, right. But not deciding to have a relapse. That's right. That's a decision that came from inside you. you. So that agency, kind of that agency. Premeditated. Right. 
Well, thank you, Dr. Joseph Gerstein. We've been having a great conversation about motivation, the different types of motivation, the fact that uh, the most important thing, as you said, is motivation number one, motivation number two, and motivation number three, which I think is a good thing for the audience to understand and, and embrace this, this idea of how it works together with commitment and the kinds of things you can get from Smart Recovery, the tools and the support that are available there. So thank you very much, Joe. I appreciate the conversation. It was a great one. And uh, hopefully we'll have you back again on the Smart Recovery podcast. I'm always available as long as I'm alive. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, yeah, podcasts with those who have passed don't go too well. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. Thanks for having me and goodbye to everyone. You're welcome. You've been listening to the Smart Recovery Podcast. I'm your host, Luke Frazier. Until next time on the podcast, stay healthy and stay connected. Thanks for listening to the Smart Recovery Podcast. Be sure to visit smartrecovery.org where you can subscribe to our e-newsletter and check out additional podcasts, blogs, videos, and more. If you found today's podcast interesting and helpful, we encourage you to share it with others. You can also find information about smart facilitator training and other ways to participate in our important work. To help us continue to provide recovery support to all the individuals who need us, please consider making a tax-deductible donation at smartrecovery.org donation or simply click the donate button on our homepage. Thanks again for listening, and we hope you'll join us for the next Smart Recovery Podcast. Until then, stay safe and stay healthy.